ABC of Relativity by Bertrand Russell Read by Derek Jacobi Everybody knows that Einstein did something astonishing, but very few people know even now exactly what it was. It is generally recognized that he revolutionized our conception of the physical world, but the new conceptions seem to many to be impossibly wrapped up in mathematical technicalities. What we need in order to understand what relativity is about is to change our imaginative picture of the world, a picture which has been handed down from remote ancestors and has been learned by each one of us in childhood. A change in our imagination is always difficult. The same sort of change was demanded by Copernicus, who taught that the earth is not stationary and that the heavens do not revolve about it once a day. To us now there is no difficulty in this, because we learned it before our mental habits have become fixed. Einstein's ideas, similarly, may be easier to generations which grow up with them, but even almost a century on, a certain effort of imaginative reconstruction is unavoidable. In exploring the surface of the earth, we make use of all our senses, and most particularly, sight and touch. We learn to judge distance roughly by eye, but rely upon touch for accuracy. Moreover, it is touch that gives us our sense of reality. Some things cannot be touched, rainbows, reflections in looking glasses and so on. Not only our geometry and physics, but our whole conception of what exists outside us is based upon the sense of touch. In studying the heavens, we are debarred from all senses except sight. We cannot touch the sun or apply a meter rule to the Pleiades. Nevertheless, astronomers unhesitatingly applied the physics which they found serviceable on the surface of the earth and which they had based upon touch. In doing so, they brought down trouble on their heads, which was not cleared up until relativity. It turned out that much of what had been learned from the sense of touch was unscientific prejudice, which must be rejected for a true picture of the world. Let us suppose that a drug is administered to you which makes you temporarily unconscious, and that when you wake, you have lost your memory, but not your reasoning powers. You awake in a balloon, which is sailing with the wind on a dark night, the night of the 5th of November, if you are in England, or of the 4th of July in America. You can see fireworks, but you cannot see the ground because of the darkness. What sort of picture of the world will you form? You will think that nothing is permanent. There are only brief flashes of light, which travel through the void in the various bizarre curves. You cannot touch these flashes of light, you can only see them. Obviously, your geometry, your physics, and your metaphysics will be quite different from those of ordinary mortals. If an ordinary mortal were with you in the balloon, you would find his description of the world unintelligible. But if Einstein were with you, you would understand him more easily than the ordinary mortal would, because you would be free from a host of preconceptions which prevent most people from understanding him. The theory of relativity depends, to a considerable extent, upon getting rid of notions which are useful in ordinary earthbound life, but not to a drugged balloonist. Circumstances on the surface of the earth suggest conceptions which turn out to be inaccurate, although they have come to seem like necessities of thought. The most important of these circumstances is that most objects on the earth's surface are fairly persistent and nearly stationary from a terrestrial point of view. If you want to travel from King's Cross to Edinburgh, you know that you will find King's Cross where it has always been, that the railway line will take the course that it did when you last made the journey, and that Waverley Station in Edinburgh will not have moved. You therefore say and think that you have travelled to Edinburgh, not that Edinburgh has travelled to you, although the latter statement will be just as accurate. Suppose all the houses in London were perpetually moving about like a swarm of bees, and that material objects were perpetually being formed and dissolved like clouds. There is nothing impossible in these suppositions. But obviously, what we call a journey to Edinburgh would have no meaning in such a world. You would begin, no doubt, by asking the taxi driver, Where is King's Cross this morning? At the station, you would have to ask a similar question about Edinburgh, but the booking office clerk would reply, What part of Edinburgh do you mean? 
Princes Street has gone to Glasgow, and Waverley Station is in the Firth of Forth. And on the journey, the stations would not be staying quiet, but some would be travelling in any direction, perhaps much faster than the train. You could not say where you were at any moment. Indeed, the whole notion that one is always in some definite place is due to the fortunate immobility of most of the large objects on the Earth's surface. The idea of place is only a practical approximation. There is nothing logically necessary about it, and it cannot be made absolutely precise. If we were not much larger than an electron, we should not have this impression of stability. King's Cross Station, which to us looks solid, will be too vast to be conceived, except by a few eccentric mathematicians. The bits of it that we could see would consist of little tiny points of matter, never coming into contact with each other, but perpetually whizzing round each other. The world of our experience will be quite as mad as the one in which the different parts of Edinburgh go for walks. If, on the other hand, you were as large as the sun, and lived as long, with a corresponding slowness of perception, you would again find a higgledy-piggledy universe without permanence. Stars and planets would come and go like morning mists, and nothing would remain in a fixed position relative to anything else. Our notion of comparative stability is due to the fact that we are about the size we are, and live on a planet of which the surface is not very hot. If this were not the case, we should not find pre-relativity physics satisfactory. Indeed, we should never have invented it. In astronomy, we depend exclusively on sight. The heavenly bodies cannot be touched, heard, smelt, or tasted. Everything in the heavens is moving relative to everything else. The earth is going round the sun. The sun is moving, much faster than an express train, towards a point in the constellation Hercules. The fixed stars are scurrying hither and thither. When you travel from place to place on the earth, you say the train moves, and not the stations, because the stations preserve their relations to each other. But in astronomy, it is arbitrary, which you call the train and which the station. Before Copernicus, people thought that the earth stood still and the heavens revolved about it once a day. Copernicus taught that, really, the earth rotates once a day, and the revolution of the sun and stars is only apparent. Galileo and Newton endorsed this view, and things were thought to prove it. For example, the flattening of the earth at the poles. But in the modern theory, the question between Copernicus and earlier astronomers is merely one of convenience. All motion is relative, and there is no difference between the two statements, the earth rotates once a day, and... The heavens revolve about the earth once a day. Astronomy is easier if we take the sun as fixed than if we take the earth, just as sums are easier in decimals than fractions. All motion is relative, and it is a mere convention to take one body as at rest. All such conventions are equally legitimate, though not all are equally convenient. Old-fashioned physics used the notion of force, which seemed intelligible because it was associated with familiar sensations. When we are walking, we have sensations connected with our muscles, which we do not have when we are sitting still. Everybody knew from experience what it is to